That never happens. Welcome to the Education, Career, and Beyond podcast. We've combined life experience with young adult drive and ambition. Are you just starting to college plan? Did you finish your education and wonder, now what? Join us in this lively discussion about the topics you need to know to create the next stage of your life's dreams, careers, finances, education, and more. Brought to you by Voice for Heroes 501c3. Welcome to another great show. You have myself, Amy, and as always, Capri Suarez coming to us from the university there at Purdue. Never misses, and she's just so dedicated, not only to her studies, but to this show that hopefully is bringing you such value and such insights on incredible topics. And today's going to be a fun discussion, as we say, a lively discussion on what you need to know. We are literally going to speak today about using drawing as that incredible thinking tool. And we're talking everything from just students, classroom of all ages, but also in the boardroom and how this is an incredible, powerful tool to enhance our learning and how much we can do. We have our guest, Ashton Rodenheiser, who is with us and she is an expert. She's with uh, Minds Eye Creative. She has created this incredible program and we've got a lot of questions to ask as this is completely expertise. And what she shared with us is she's coming to us from Nova Scotia. So we've uh, come in all over the place here as we bring you this incredible information and hopefully changing lives wherever you're enjoying this podcast. Welcome to the show, Ashton. I am so happy to be here. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me on. Yes. Welcome We're back, so Capri. Happy to have you. Yeah, thank um, you. Would you like to start by telling us a little bit about yourself and why you love doodling so much? <laughs> yeah, so I, I really struggled in school not knowing what it was that I wanted to do. So I didn't know that this was a thing that you could kind of do. All I really wanted to do and be in life was a mother. So I decided to pursue early childhood education. And when I left school there, I was like, what am I, what kind of job am I going to get? I don't know. So I started working at a nonprofit family resource center, working with like parents and children. And while I was there, I learned about facilitation and about how you can create real safe spaces for people to come and have a conversation about what it is they're moving through, right? And the Family Resource Center was like parenting issues that they were working through, right? Mm -hmm. So as a facilitator, it's less about you knowing all of the information and trying to impart that onto somebody. It's about hearing what someone is saying and feeding back what you're hearing and helping them kind of like draw out some of their own wisdom and feed that back to them. And I really just fell in love with facilitation as uh, a career. So I did that for a little while until I was introduced uh, just about 10 years ago now. It's like my 10-year anniversary this month in graphic facilitation. Yeah, thank you, into graphic facilitation. And I didn't even know what that was at the time. Um, but basically, I took this one-day workshop, and I was like, this is it. Like, this is what I want to do. And it's just this beautiful blend of the facilitation world and – the creative side that I've always really been sort of fascinated by. And I think if it might've been supported a bit more when I was younger, maybe I would have went into more of an art kind of field. Um, I think I maybe wanted to be secretly an artist when I grew up, but I just didn't think that was possible for me. So yeah, just this beautiful blend of the two. And yeah, that was 10 years ago. So yeah, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> That's great. Well, I Thanks for sharing. I want to ask the first obvious question to get it out of the way because sure. I am creative as a musician, mm -hmm. but I can't draw a stick figure and I am made fun of for my penmanship. <laughs> like nobody <laughs> wants me writing or using a pen in any way for any reason, but I'll sing to right. you, right? So when yeah. somebody comes to you right off the bat and says, I really don't want to know more about this because I can't draw. Let's just yeah. start with that, which I'm sure is probably the most common question you get. <laughs> yeah, it's really about redefining what drawing is. And I think when people say they can't draw, what they mean is they they can't illustrate, like they're not an illustrator. And there's a certain notion that comes to mind when you think of illustration versus drawing. And if I usually what I say is if you can write words, which sounds like Amy, maybe you struggle with a little bit, but if you can write words, you can draw because drawings are just letter or yeah, letters are just drawings in disguise, right? All drawing is, is combining lines. You have a line, you turn that line into an arrow, you turn it into a circle, you turn it into a square, right? So 
if you can draw a letter, even if it's messy, <laughs> you can draw and you can learn the, the basic elements of how to use drawing as a thinking tool in if, like 15 minutes, right? It's like not rocket science because I just sort of laid it out for you. <laughs> like you can even draw a stick person if you want to. <laughs> like those are those are great. So when you're when you I, I feel like, you know, sometimes when I have an opportunity to talk about this and things that I do, it's really about it's less about worrying and thinking about, oh my gosh, I have to draw, but it's about using communication in a visual way to help yourself think, to help yourself learn, to help yourself engage, help yourself stay focused in the moment, right? To help yourself communicate an idea to somebody else, right? And I think uh, many of us have been in a situation where you're at a bar, you're at a restaurant, and someone's like, oh, do you have a pen? Do you have a napkin? And you write something down, right? You do a little squiggle, squiggle to try to explain something, right? That's using drawing as a way to help communicate to like gain clarity and understanding around something. And we don't have to think about drawing as an art form at all. Like sure, it certainly has its places and we can be inspired by someone else's artwork, but it's not about using drawing as a way just to like appreciate and get inspiration, which is still great, but it's about using it in a very, very, very basic way to help yourself think in the moment. Or so it could be you're listening to a presentation or it could be you're trying to brainstorm something for yourself and gain that clarity. Wow. I didn't look at it that way. I always talk about like word pictures in my head when I'm memorizing lyrics or scripts or things that I need to be doing. And I'll utilize word pictures for that anchor word that, that starts off that next paragraph or whatever I'm memorizing. So right. what you're describing here is actually really putting that pen to paper with that same concept. Yeah. And I, I think like there is enough studies out there that say like putting pen to paper is very valuable. Like there's always going to be times where maybe taking minute notes or whatever on your laptop is what's going to work best for you at the time, but still putting pen to paper and like being in the action of that learning is so incredibly important. And a lot of us, you know, are doodlers and doodling has got a bit of a bad rap and doodling can actually help us retain up to 29% more information, even if that doodle has nothing to do with what it is that you're listening to. So the way that I like to say when you think about drawing as your or your communication tool is if you're doing like little doodles anyways, like make them work for you, make them do something for you, right? Use them in a way to help you out also incorporate information into it. Yeah. Great. How would you recommend um, starting, like doing sketch notes, as you call them on your website? Um, how would, yeah, how would you recommend going about starting that, like making those doodles more associated to what you're actually taking notes on? Yeah, so sketch noting is like a common term for personal visual note taking. So the same skills that I use when I'm working you know, in a conference room with 3,000 people or in a small boardroom of executives is a, still the same skill set, just a different name, whether it's graphic recording, graphic facilitation, or sketch noting. Um, usually what I tell people it, to, to get started is to get a notebook or grab some white, plain piece of paper where you want to kind of ditch the lined paper because if you've got lines, you're going to revert back to traditional note taking, right? And we want to kind of, we want to change things up, right? So take that white piece of paper. If it's a color, that's fine too. And instead of holding a portrait style, like we usually do with our lined paper, you're going to turn it on its side. So those two small shifts, taking your piece of paper, now it's plain and turning it on its side. That in itself is enough to trigger your brain to go, okay, we're doing something different here. What are we doing? What's going on? Like, and the blank was really science with that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And, and, you know, if you, you know, if, if you give yourself that space, then you're not going to revert back to just the filling in the lines. Right. But a blank page can be extremely intimidating. Yes. Right. So usually I say, just make a mark on it. It could just be putting the date could be putting your name. It could be like the title of a presentation you're listening to or whatever it is that you're trying to think about, right? Just stick a title on it. It doesn't even have to have any images at this point if you want. Like in that example that you're seeing there, like draw your first sketch note is just 
in a little wave with two little lines, right? So that's what I would have started with for, for that one. And when you're capturing information around the page, you're like, well, where do I capture it? Like, I don't like, it's all blank. I, I don't know. So what we want to do is write, block your content in invisible boxes. So you write a few words, then you go underneath and you write a few words and you go underneath and you write a few words. And now you've got like little boxes of information all around your page and white space around it that you can add a line to connect information. You can put some speech bubbles around some things to show that those belong together, right? So we're not like, I don't even teach people how to like draw icons and things until like way beyond like not like that's not something that we even that I even touch on in the first little while when I'm teaching people. We just want to focus on the foundation of, you know, how we're capturing our content because content's always going to be king or queen, still going to be extremely important. But we're just starting to add in some of these like little visual elements like lines and arrows and things. And there's purpose uh, behind why we're using them to connect information, to separate, to group, to emphasize, things like that. Thanks for sharing. Capri, are you already utilizing any of this in your studies? And let's discuss, especially um, you being in your second year of college, how, how do you already see this and what are your thoughts? I mean, personally, I've always enjoyed the process of note taking more when I'm able to have like kind of the creative freedom. I know that Cornell notes are great format, but that doesn't necessarily work for me because I feel like I can't always get all my ideas out. So I feel like I already kind of do the thing where I block it out on paper, but I think more pictures could be useful because I definitely used to be a doodler, but then I stopped doing mm -hmm. it because I, everyone always is like, oh, like that's bad. Like pay attention to the lecture, take notes instead. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I think this is really interesting and definitely a way also to kind of stay like if you're just mindlessly moving your hand, you can focus more on what they're saying versus like trying to furiously write down every word. And I think that's a really cool yeah. idea. Yeah. yeah, the thing the thing that I really love, I think, about this is, you know, a lot of times when we're just straight, you know, note taking online pieces of paper, we're missing the most important element, which is thinking while we're listening. Mm -hmm. So we hear what they're saying, we write it down. We hear what they're saying, we write it down. But when we hear it, when you're doing this type of note taking, you have to stop and think for a second while you're also listening. It's a bit of a challenge when you first start, but you kind of, you know, you get your muscle memory going with it, right? Yeah. You have to think about what you're listening to and try to make sense of it at the same time then and you're capturing. So it's like a, it's like a cycle, listening, making sense, capturing, listening, making sense, capturing. And it's all kind of happening at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. So it is more intense, not even just adding in the visual piece, but now you're thinking, you're like, oh, they just said that. I captured this here. They just said that. That connects. Okay. So I'm going to put that here because that belongs there. Right. So the example that I always tend to give is, you know, if you're a school teacher and you're looking over the shoulders of two students, which one can, and one's doing more traditional line note taking, one's doing this type of note taking, you know, which one can you see the understanding or the learning? Right. We can't mm -hmm. see understanding and learning. And I feel like drawing should be an art in general, actually, really is about um, creating a conversation. Right. Art creates conversation. Right. So sketch noting or visual note taking, you can see where the learning is or what learning is missing. And then it creates a conversation. It adds like the teacher has the opportunity to go, oh, actually, this note over here should belong over here. And yeah. we live in an instant gratification world where now you have this note that you can go, right, right. I remember what they said. Yep. Got it. Right. Instead of like going through reams and reams and pages and pages of notes, mm. you know, in lines, be like, I don't even know. Like, I don't know what was said. Right. Because yeah. you, you, you also missed out on that thinking and that synthesizing, right? And you made a good point, Capri, of like, you're trying to not write down every word, right? So you are trusting your brain that you're going to remember those things. And when you kind of add a visual to it, right? When you, there's like Alan Pavio's dual coding theory, when you add words and pictures together, solidifies that learning even further. 
Ashton, can you walk us through an example, like especially if you've worked with a young college student like Capri is and, and a lot of her cohorts there at school, can you walk us through an example of a time that maybe there was that aha, or you really saw somebody make a tremendous improvement in their study habits by utilizing this? Yeah, I think, um, let me try to think of an example, but I think for me, once I, I do, I do love winning people over who think they can draw. And then they just get like a half an hour with me and like, yeah, see, you can draw. And they're like, yeah, I can. So I think it's it's a confidence thing. And from what my experience is um, with students and others is once you draw your first one, it's so much easier, right? And that's why I know you pulled up, like draw your first sketch note, do like a little 15 yes. minute, like clip video. Um, and that's why I put that together because once you draw your first one, it's so much easier <laughs> to draw your second one, right? Because you realize it's not as scary as it looks, right? So um, yeah, I'm not sure if I can give a very specific example, but that's just something that I tend to experience with everybody. So whatever I can do to try to get people to put pen to paper and do it in a really like safe space, um, you know, it, people really resonate with it beyond that. Yeah. Like, you know, I think the youngest I've ever taught was like 10, I think. Wow. And we, and I did like a little half day workshop when some kids were like out of school on a Friday, like an in-service day, they call it here. And um, yeah, within like three hours, like they were listening to Ted talks, doing them and they're 10. Wow. You know? That's so, crazy. And of course, when you're 10, you don't have as much of a hang up. You haven't had as much experience in the world of someone saying you're not creative or you can't draw or you know what I mean? So <laughs> it's like I have small kids and we do art together all the time, obviously, because, you know, who's their mom? And you you ask kids, even when I worked with them before and, and my own kids and you ask them if they're an artist, they're like, yeah, <laughs> like they don't have like because if they have never had that negative experience to say, oh, you're doing that wrong. You're coloring outside the lines. How dare you? Or I remember mine was when I was nine and my teacher told me I was painting wrong. Like a lot of people have those experiences at some point in their life that told them they were not creative. And creativity, in my opinion, is like one of the biggest skill sets that an employer if you want to work for someone, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for creative thinkers, right? So whether or not you use sketchnoting or not, just creativity in general, right? You kind of have like take back your own power when it comes to, you know, saying like, yes, I am creative. And maybe it's not drawing, like maybe that isn't it, but it is like for you, Amy, it's like your music and your, and uh, your singing and things like that, right? So, and like, you need to be in spaces where you're being supported in that way, right? Right, right. You know, it's I love that you touched on working with the the young ones and and even the youngest being ten years old. What has been some of the biggest obstacles when you're dealing with the maybe more mature professional who's been in their career mm -hmm. for quite a few years? What what obstacles do they provide you that you've been able to get them to overcome? <laughs> What's your oldest um, student? <laughs> it's so funny because. The people that I tend to struggle with the most are like the middle of the range people, like the kids and the mm -hmm. students. They're like, I get this, right? Like, this mm -hmm. is, they're like, you know, they have someone now in their life that's giving them permission to do something that they were told to maybe they weren't allowed to do before. And then I, I, I still do a lot of like facilitated things uh, where I'll draw in a meeting and I'll have a co-facilitator and we'll be like, you know, working through executives, like their strategic planning or whatever it is that they're working through, right? And oftentimes the facilitator that I work with will bring toys to the meeting, right? We'll bring slinkies, we'll bring Play-Doh, we'll bring fidget spinners, and we just throw them on the tables. And almost every single time, the top dog, <laughs> the top of the top person who's at that meeting, they're the first ones to pick it up and play, right? And you'd think that's the, op like you wouldn't necessarily expect that if you were just looking at it like on paper, like, oh, well, they're the CEO of this big, big company. Like they're gonna look at these fidget spinners and they're gonna be like, 
well, this meeting might must not be very serious <laughs> because they put fidget spinners on the table. But they are the ones that tend to gravitate towards that the most, wow. which is so funny. It's the people below them that are like, mm, I'm not sure, right? It's the like, well, maybe I might not be perceived. I don't know if it's like a perception thing. Like I might mm -hmm. not be so professional if if I pick up the fidget spinner, but once they see the CEO pick up the Play-Doh or the, <laughs> like you just see them walking around the room with the fidget spinner. I just think, you know, I just love it. Of course, I geek, I geek out every time. I'm like, this is why we bring these things to show that this isn't just a normal meeting and we can add in like a little playfulness while also getting really serious work done. Right. So um, I know that wasn't really an example, maybe the example you were looking for, but it just I find it such an interesting extreme that yes. I've experienced in my work of like the people that sometimes you think would be like, oh, that's not professional. They're the ones that lean in on the creative, playful types of things. And those are the obviously there are the types of CEOs that want to invite me there to teach or to illustrate a complex topic that they're working through because they understand the value of, you know, because I'm definitely not entertainment when people are hiring me, like that's a whole other thing. I'm there to help like as a communication expert. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, I want to touch real quick on um, one of your values and you kind of started to go into it a little bit, but accessibility, how mm -hmm. does being um, having a visual representation or a drawing help make those ideas more accessible? Because I think that's something that's not only important, but like vital. Yeah, that's that's such an important piece of my work, too. And I really have spent the last like two or so years on trying to figure out how to make my work even more accessible. So I put like when I'm working with people professionally to create graphics for them, I provide alt text. I do audio descriptions. I do um, like the audio descriptions is like a video file that has captions on it. So people can try to understand what is in the visual if they can't see it a hundred percent. Right. So there's that sort of world. And then there's the like neurodiverse space. So I tend to work a lot and teach people who have like ADHD or mm -hmm. other types of like neuroprocessing issues. Yeah. And so you know, it's a really cool skill that can be extremely beneficial for th those types of people. But then also from like a, like I do a lot of conference work. So, you know, we put our, we, we make people sit through um, scenarios and situations that are not always going to be friendly mm -hmm. to people, right? Like we're, we're catering mm -hmm. these types of events to people who are like more neurotypical, like I'm okay to sit here for eight hours and listen to <laughs> like, you know, 10 speakers in a row and like, remember it all. Like it's impossible, even if you're neuro neurotypical, like to remember it all. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you cannot physically, mentally sit there in that meeting for that minute or that presentation for that half an hour, you need a break. Um, you don't get to miss out on the information if I'm doing it for you. Right. Or if someone's sketch noting your friend, you guys are like tag teaming. I'll do one. You do one. And then you can fill each other in or you know what I mean? Like there's so much opportunity either if I'm doing it or if, you know, you'll learn that skill for yourself to kind of help you stay focused. And then, you know, also have them to be able to reflect on later. So just adding visuals and words can help you um, increase that action of that understanding by like 89%. So the fact that you have more of a likelihood to actually do something about that information, it, like that's a pretty impressive number, right? But if you can't even sit through that meeting or you're like, you just like, you have a processing issue or something and you can't get it all in one big sitting like we don't want people missing out on the information because we have put people into situations where that's not going to be the friendliest way for them to learn you know what i mean and i think it goes well beyond learning styles at this point mm -hmm. right like even though technically learning styles have been debunked people still relate to them like I'm an auditory, I'm a kinesthetic, I'm a visual, I'm a so-and-so, right? But it goes like way beyond learning styles at this point, right? It goes, you know, folks who are autism, ADHD, like anything, anybody like who consider themselves to be neurodiverse, 
right? Like I have a friend who did a whole case study with a high school student who has dysgraphia and how it totally changed their note taking. And dysgraphia is this like wow. connection between like your brain and your hand as there's a disconnect there. So like, you know what you want to write, but like your hand just is not working, right? And how like he took his like it doesn't even look like the same person that took these notes because they couldn't actually take notes before because it was just such a challenge to then like they have this like really cool um graphic that they created about like how their brain works it wow. works it's like a toilet and it gets clogged and then sketch noting helps me do unclog the toilet it's like a whole funny thing right yeah um you know so i i think it's like a I like these. Uh, to me, I feel like right now I'm just on this mission to try to get people to understand what a powerful tool this is if you choose to mm -hmm. use it, right? No matter, you know, who you are and what your background is or what abilities you have. Awesome. You have definitely opened my mind to that today, for sure. Realize <laughs> even as much as I'm sitting here at my desk and taking notes and doing things and listening to conferences, like you mentioned, to really look at this from a different perspective to help me also be more efficient and retain more. I think it's fantastic. How fun is this? What a <laughs> tremendous value. I'm sorry you didn't get to ask very many questions because I can be kind of long-winded. So it was perfect. Oh, it was great. Capri, was this helpful for you too? Yes, so helpful. I do have I one more fun last question for you, though. What is your favorite yeah. thing to doodle? Oh, my gosh. Well, I find a people, <laughs> not everybody, but a lot of people have like a go-to doodle. So sometimes when I'm mm -hmm. doing workshops and stuff, I'll be like, okay, if you have a go-to little doodle that you do, what is it? And mine's actually like a little snail. It's just always been it since like oh. my whole life. I just do like a little swirl, turn it in, uh -huh. and make a little head, make a little tail line yeah. line. There's, there's your little snail. <laughs> How cute. That's so cute. On yeah. I think my favorite icon to draw in sketch noting is a light bulb. It was one of the first things that I learned how to draw in sketch while I was learning how to do this work. You can put mm -hmm. a light bulb on everything. You know, it's the, <laughs> you know, you put it by like this is the one thing I really want to remember. Um, or you want there's always like an idea that you want to highlight, right? or like a main point or something. So I would say in sketch noting, my favorite icon is a, is a light bulb. But if I'm just doodling, you know, um, kind of outside of sketch note world, <laughs> then I'm a little snail. Yeah. I love it. Awesome. <laughs> Capri, I'm going to want to see your doodles next week. Oh, You're going to want to show us what you can do. Awesome. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Well, where can, if uh, listeners want to find out more about you, where can they find you? Yeah, so mindseyecreative.ca is kind of everything related to me as a professional live illustrator. So if you want, if you're feeling uh, up for it, you can actually put in my new other website, which is all about teaching sketchnoting, and that's sketchnote.school. And I have a free weekly newsletter. I have an online community that I host in a platform called Circle. That's so fun. We do like live calls. And I have a, a book that I wrote called The Beginner's Guide to Sketchnoting. And it truly is beginners. Like it, I, I spent a year and a half. I did three rounds of beta reading with 1,500 pieces of feedback to muster through. And to, to write this book, The Beginner's Guide to Sketchnoting, because I wanted to make sketch noting as like easy for people to understand and learn as possible so this is you know having the book and having it in a way that can be really um easy for people to learn uh and then I, then my community is so fun because i get to like answer questions and help people and when i find something new and exciting or like i was doing an interview the other week and someone told me about a visual that their professor used in, in college. So I, I took that and shared that with my community and things like that. So um, yeah, that's sort of where I'm hanging out mostly. these. Love days. it. Yeah. And both links are in the show notes. However you're enjoying this podcast, the links to these sites are there in your notes so you can reach out. I appreciate that. I had such a great time. Thank Ashton, you. Ashton, thank you. This is so, so glad you can appreciate it. <laughs> Capri? Oh. Of course. Um, well, thank you for coming on today. Such a great conversation. We'll definitely um, take more pride in my doodling capabilities <laughs> from now on. And to all of our listeners, we'll be here same time, same place next week. 
All right. This is the Education, Career, and Beyond podcast. I'm Capri, and Amy is also with us. And unfortunately, Ed cannot be, but maybe he'll be here next week. Awesome.